book of John, if you would. John chapter, not J-O-N, J-O-H-N. The book of John chapter 20. Be reading verses 21 and 22. I want to speak to you this morning on mandates from the Master. Mandates from the Master. Reading the scripture, it says, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. And he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. You know, there's a lot of quirks about us and, and human beings. We don't like to take orders. Does anyone here like to take orders? How many times in your life? Now, I want you to be honest. It, I know it's difficult. But how many of you have, have had someone, a significant other, or a loved one say something to you, and you turn around and said, don't tell me what to do? Huh? Come on. Be honest. That's the way human beings are. We don't like to take orders. Don't order me around. Sometimes Marianne will say, do I look like your slave? You know, it's human beings, we have a problem. We have a problem taking orders. There's a man named Horatio Nelson who was a British flag officer in the Royal Navy. He said, the man who has no respect for orders will always take orders from the one that does. Nathaniel Hell, who was a spy in the Continental Army, said a dedicated and disciplined person is one who follows the will of the one who gives him the orders. Michael Pena, an actor, said heroism does not occur from taking orders. Heroism is the result of people with the willpower, the courage, and the strength to sacrifice their very life to carry out an order. Loved ones, listen to me. Whether we like it or not, we serve a God of order. Everything he's done from the creation of the entire universe is built upon order, and it's also built upon his orders. Everything we experience in life are because of God's order. The Bible tells me he ordered the light to shine. Genesis chapter 1 verse 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And then he, he ordered a place for creation, because out of the chasm of darkness, there had to be a place for his creation. Genesis chapter 1 verse 6 says, God said, let there be an expanse, a place. Let there be an expanse in the midst of the water and let it separate the waters from the water. But he also ordered land to appear in that expanse. Later on in the scripture in verse 9, God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. All of those are by the direct order of Almighty God. He ordered light, he ordered a place, he ordered land, and then he ordered food to grow. Later on in Genesis chapter 1 verse 11, he said, Let the earth sprout vegetation and plants yielding seed and fruit, trees bearing fruit in which is their seed. Later on in verse 14, he ordered the stars to shine. In verse 16, he ordered the sun and the moon to rule the world. In verse 20, he ordered living creatures to inhabit the earth. And finally... Finally, we get to verse 26 in Genesis chapter 1. And God made George McDonald. And ever since God made George McDonald, we've had to put up with Nancy. Amen. There ain't no one like her sister to know better. Amen. In verse 26, God created man. He's a God of order. But he's also a God that issues orders. 
Now, I want you to notice this. The first thing God did after he created mankind, after he created George McDonald, is he said, here's an order. Be fruitful. Multiply. Inhabit the earth. Our God is a, is a God of orders. And Lord, help us as Christians to understand we have a responsibility to follow orders. Orders from headquarters. You know, I'm an old, I'm a military guy, ship's captain, the Coast Guard guy, and one of the things that was drilled into us early on as a young man was we don't question orders, we follow orders. And no matter what our mind tells us, no matter what our family tells us, no matter what friends and associates may come around me and say, I am to follow orders. Every Christian should live an orderly life. We should live a life of being faithful to the orders of Jesus Christ, a life following His very life, a life fulfilling orders. It's our responsibility. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, watch this, that we should walk in them. Didn't say that we might walk in them, that we may walk in them. He says that we should walk in them. That very last line of verse 10 there in Ephesians chapter 2 speaks volumes. The word that he's giving us in his holy word, I want you to know, it is not a suggestion. It's not supposition. It is not superstition. Jesus issued orders to his church, and he issued orders collectively. But listen, not only did he issue collective orders, He issued individual orders to each one of us. And every single order is important. Every single order has value. And remember when Jesus spoke orders to almost everyone that he came in contact with, Jesus said, follow me. That's an order. It's not a suggestion. Another order from God's word, follow me me. Don't follow your way. Follow my way. I want you to imagine if if Jesus was standing in front of you right now, and if he was calling you by name, and if he said, Ellen, walk like I walk. Nate, talk like I talk. Susan, love like I love. Boy, I don't know how to do this one. George, lead like I lead. Brandon, lift like I lift. Those are orders from the commander-in-chief of our army, Jesus Christ. And in verse 21, he makes it clear to us, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you you. So this morning, I want us to put our arms around God's Word. I want us to to embrace these concepts and these precepts that these are mandates. They're mandates from the Master. I believe we need to pay attention in this passage of Scripture to the fact that His mandate is my mandate. Verse 21, As the Father has sent me. You know, I find numerous passages of Scripture in God's holy word that tells us that the Father sent the Son, and the Son was obedient to the Father. The Son followed orders, and we're to follow the orders of the Son. Amen? Luke chapter 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. John chapter 3 verse 17 says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved. 
1 John 4, 14, we've seen and we testify that the Father sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. There's an undeniable fact. Every one of these verses point to the fact that Jesus came to be the Savior of mankind. He didn't merely come to be a deliverer from problems. He didn't necessarily come to become a humanitarian envoy. He didn't come just to show compassion to the sick and the hurting. He wasn't sent just to be a great teacher, though he was. He wasn't sent to be a a politician. The sole reason Jesus came to this earth was to be our Savior our Savior and our Lord. And it's all about His purpose. And it's all about His propensity. And it's all about His promise to be the Savior, the Savior of mankind. I read this last week about a politician, a Hindu priest, and a Jewish rabbi. Now there's a combination. They all got together and they decided to make a trip together. And they got way out in the stick somewhere, way out in the woods, and their car broke down. So now it's getting late and the darkness is coming down and they're beside the road and the car is not running. And they got out and they, they happened to see a light off in the distance. There was a farmer's house. So they walked to the farmer's house and told the farmer what happened. He said, well, guys, look, it's already dark. You know, we can't do anything in the dark. Why don't you just spend the night here? You can stay here at my house. He said, the only problem is I only have two beds. Somebody's going to have to sleep in the barn. So the the Hindu priest, he stepped up first. He said, well, that's all right, guys. I'm kind of used to roughing it. I'll, I'll go out and sleep in the barn. Everybody thanked him. The Hindu priest went out to the barn. Wasn't five minutes later, he comes back to the front door. They said, what are you doing? He said, I can't sleep out there. There's cows out there. I'm a Hindu. Cows are a holy animal. I can't can't sleep around the cows. So the guys kind of talk back and forth amongst themselves a little bit. and Finally, the Jewish rabbi said, well, Well, look, I'll sleep out in the barn. It's all right. I'll go out to the barn. The rabbi went out to the barn. Wasn't two or three minutes later, he showed up back at the front door. They said, what are you doing? What? what? What's the deal here? The rabbi said, look, I I can't sleep out there. There's pigs out there. There's pigs in that barn. That's an unclean animal. I, I can't be around an unclean animal. Finally, the politician had had all of this that he could stand. And he said, look, you guys can't come to a conclusion. I'll go out there and sleep in the barn. He said, fine. The politician took off to the barn. About two or three minutes later, a cow and a pig showed up at the front door. Jesus didn't come to be a politician. Amen? We need less politicians. We need more Christians. And we need more Christians that will follow mandates from the Master. You know, more the, the more things change, I'm afraid the more they, they stay the same. If God was concerned about the economy, He would have sent us an economist. If He was concerned about our entertainment, He would have sent us a comedian. If his main priority in life was our health, he would have sent us a doctor. But God perceived in his great wisdom and in his grace that the greatest need of mankind was freedom from sin. Alienation from a holy God. A rebellion to goodness and decency. And his mandate was for satisfaction of the soul of men, and that was the mandate of Christ. And listen to me this morning, that is our mandate. 
is bringing people to Jesus. Bringing people to eternal life. It should surpass every career objective we've ever had. It's more important than any educational requirement. It's a critical element to the disposition of our personality. I remember in God's Word the story of Jesus when he was 12 years old. Jesus, you might say, he ran away from home. He was missing for three days. Mary and Joseph searched frantically. They couldn't find their son. They looked around. They looked everywhere. Jesus was nowhere to be found. And Luke chapter 2 verse 46 tells the story. Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of teachers, listening to them, asking them questions. And all who heard them were astonished at his understanding and answers. You see, Jesus was all about the mandate from his Father. He told us, I must be about my Father's business. The business of the Father was the business of the Son. And our business is the business of the Son. There's a great pastor and evangelist of, of past years named Dwight L. Moody. D.L. Moody. By the way, I come out of a church in Arlington, Texas, and when I was there, the pastor's name was D.L. Moody believe it or not. And he used to get up and to preach and he'd say, I'm the other great D.L. Moody. But D.L. Moody was never ordained to Christian ministry. He was a shoe salesman. A simple shoe salesman that had gotten saved and God had intervened in his life and and had given him an excitement for people and an excitement for life and an excitement for salvation. And he is known as the one who started the first church bus ministry without a bus. Because you see, in his day, they didn't have buses. So he took horse-drawn carriages and went around Chicago picking up little boys and little girls and bringing them to church, he was following the mandate of the master. He made God's business his business. So this morning, could I tell you that out of our text, I see first of all that his mandate is my mandate. But not only that, his mission is my mission. Look at verse 21. Even so, I am sending you. We have a mission to perform. You and I are on a mission. And our mission should be His mission. And here's the things that I see in God's Word that were the mission of Jesus Christ. First of all, He was there to reveal the Father. John chapter 14, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. That's good enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me, watch that. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. In essence, Jesus looked at Philip and said, you're looking at him. You want to see him? Here I am. His mission was revealing the Father, and just as that was Christ's mission, it's our mission. Loved ones, listen to me. People ought to see Jesus Christ in our life. We shouldn't even have to tell them. They ought to be drawn to us. They ought to see it by the way we walk and by the way we talk and by the way we act. What's important to us? What are the critical elements of our life? They need to see Jesus, and they don't need to just see Jesus in word. They need to see Jesus in action. 
Matthew chapter 5 says, Let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. I like a story I saw one time of a, a little girl that was talking to her daddy. And she asked daddy, she said, Daddy, how big is God? Is, is he as big as you are? And daddy looked at her and said, Oh, honey, God is, God is so much bigger than daddy will ever be. And the little girl looked at her daddy and she was kind of puzzled. And she said, well, Dad, uh, my Sunday school teacher told us that we ought to have Jesus living in our heart. She said, won't he stick out? Now, you know, that's kind of funny. And from the babes of, and children, the truth comes. Here's the truth. Jesus ought to stick out of us. He ought to be so big that He overflows in us. Jesus ought to be so grand in our life that people can't get past His image. That they see Him before they ever, ever, ever see us. Jesus ought to stick out. Jesus was on a mission to reveal the Father, but He was also on a mission to redeem mankind. Revelation chapter 5 says they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open the seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. To be redeemed is to be bought, to be purchased back. That means that something had taken control of us and there was a price that had to be paid for us to be redeemed. And when Jesus redeemed us, He freed us. He freed us from the penalty of sin. He freed us from the power of sin. He, fe he freed us from the presence of sin. And the only true freedom in life that you and I will ever have it's when we're loved by Him, when we're living for Him, when we're lifted by Him, and when we're led by Him. John chapter 8 says, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus was on a mission to reveal. He was on a mission to redeem. But listen, He was also on a mission to raise the church. Remember when Jesus was meeting with Peter and he said, Upon this rock I will build my church. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says, We are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. You know, when we look around this building, and by the way, aren't we blessed? I mean it. You look at what God's provided for us here. How comfortable we are here. The things He's given us to enjoy here in this building. But when I think about the building, I can't help but think about the fact that it's made up of numerous materials. It took so many materials to build this building. From concrete to, to steel structure to sheetrock electricity. Thank God for air conditioning. If you live here, you got to have air conditioning. But listen to me. The building is made up of numerous materials, but when the building was being built, it was one material at a time. You see, they weren't able to take every single material and just throw it all together at once and this building came out. That's not the way it works. You have to do one thing at a time. You have to use one element at a time. And listen, God's mandate for us, mandates from the Master, is that we're to go out and reach souls. 
one at a time. That's exactly how he intended for his church to be built. One at a time. We can't go out and coerce the whole masses at one time. That can't be done. It's not feasible. And even if it were, it wouldn't be beneficial. Because listen to me, Jesus is a personal Savior. Personal. One at a time. And the mission of Jesus Christ was put into place by God the Father, and it was built one at a time. The completion is an elemental process. God's mission for us, just as Jesus' mission from the Father was to raise the church, is that we are to raise the church one soul at a time. I want you to think about this. There is not one passage of Scripture anywhere in God's Word that commands the lost to attend his house. Think about that. Do we understand that? God's mandate, God's edicts, God's principles are for his children. There are multitudes of verses in God's word that tell you and me we're responsible to go out and get them. We're responsible to bring them in. That's our responsibility. And think about it. Most of us are here because somebody went out and got us. Somebody took time to witness to us. Somebody helped us carry a burden. Somebody loved us enough to pray with us. Somebody simply invited us. One at a time. Critical to what we do in our life. So I notice that his mandate is my mandate. His mission is my mission. But I also notice his motive is my motive. Look at verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Human beings have a, a multitude of motives, <laughs> don't we? We have motives that drive our life. We have motives that cause us to act in the ways that we act. I hate to say it, it applies to me too. You know, anytime I'm doing this, it's this. Comes right back to John. Most of our motives are selfish. Some of them are sensuous. But if you'll stop and think about it, they're all selective. We select our motives. Whether we realize it or not, we, we prioritize based on what's important to us, and we select our motives. I want you, how many of you got your Bible with you? Brandon did this a few weeks ago when he preached, and it's good. Sometimes I think we need, to, we need to pay attention to some things. I want you to turn in your Bible, and if you don't have a Bible with you, Kathleen will have it up on the, on the screen. But I want us to go to the book of Exodus. And I'll give you just a moment to get there. This was not in my original message. was not in my original message notes. But God spoke it to me, I believe, yesterday, and I mentioned to Kathleen, and she was good enough to be able to, to go quickly put it in the multimedia presentation so we'd have it up there. If you have your Bible, turn to Exodus chapter 20 and go to verse 3. A very simple passage of Scripture, and this ought to be familiar, especially if you're a Christian, because this is part of the original commandments that God gave to Moses on the mountain. 
Look at verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. Let me repeat that. You shall have no other gods before me. Does that sound like a suggestion to you? Doesn't sound like a suggestion at all to me. I believe God's word is abundantly, abundantly clear. Listen, loved ones. Anything that we put above our Lord, anything that we allow to come in front of Him, anything that we make more important than Him is a God. Do you hear me? And we do it all the time. We don't show up at His house. We want some sleep. Now, I understand that, and I'm looking out at you, and some of you are sleeping right now. And that's the reason I preach as long as I do, so that you can get just a little bit extra rest. Because I care about you, and I love you. But listen, loved ones, it's so easy to look at that passage of Scripture in the book of Exodus and believe, oh, that's talking about how we worship or denominationalism, or religion. Oh, I hate religion. And when I read God's Word, it tells me Jesus hated religion. He called them a bunch of snakes that put burdens on people's backs, won't help them carry them. But I want you to hear me and listen to me carefully. If you put your job before being in God's house, You're making it a God before Him. If you put your children's school activities ahead of being in God's house and of worshiping Him, you're making a God out of your children. You're putting them before Him. Anything that we make more important than Almighty God, than our Savior Jesus Christ, we're making it a God. We're worshiping it. My Bible told me in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. When are we going to wake up? When are we going to get serious? We let everything in life become so important to us, and then we wonder why our families are falling apart. We wonder why we're not happy. We're not fulfilled. We have psychological problems. We have sociological problems. We wonder why all these things are happening, and the answer is so simple. It's given to us in God's Word. You don't know who God is. You're making everything else your God, and it's wrecking your life. It's destroying your family and your children. It's destroying our nation. Is there one person here today that can even remotely say our nation's not in crisis? That it's not in peril? That things aren't in upheaval? Why? We've forgotten all the mandates of the Master. We failed to stand on the mandates. We've failed to have the same motive that Jesus had. We failed to be on the same mission that Jesus was on. And it never will produce anything but chaos. And I wish I was telling Kathleen this week as a pastor I I get so frustrated and torn in my heart because I love you so much. But I see families in our church that are always having trouble and problems and difficulties and emotional upheaval and everything is tipsy-turvy and chaos in their life and I just 
can't seem to get them to take God's word and believe it. Because I know that if we believe God's word, if we stand on God's word, if we make his mandate our mandate, it'll change your life. It'll completely revolutionize your family. It'll change your career opportunities. It'll impact your education. His mandate is my mandate. And I need to make his motives my motives. You know, Acts chapter 1 says you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, it says, you will be my witnesses. Part of the problem with the church is we've got people trying to be witnesses that have no Holy Spirit. There's no Spirit leading them. There's no Spirit guiding their life. And where there's no Spirit, I want you to remember this, there is no power. But notice what power produces. Acts chapter 1 says, the power of the Holy Spirit produces witnesses. When we receive the Holy Spirit, we'll be motivated like Jesus. We'll be motivated to reveal the Father. We'll be motivated to redeem mankind. We'll be motivated to raise the church. But Jesus was also motivated motivated by obedience. Philippians 2.8 says, Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Our obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ should surpass our own life. And obedience is not a convenience factor. It's not a, hey, I feel like it. It's not a matter of parameters that we set in our life and not a, not a compartmentalization that we, we take life and we make some priorities of our life over here and then we put this little box over here and that's our Jesus box. No! No! Jesus was obedient to his Father. I remember when I was a little boy... Sometimes dad would come in and he'd say, son, take out that trash. Now I can just imagine if I had said, no, thank you, dad, that's not my calling to take out the trash. Dad, not right now, I'm watching the Dallas Cowboys. I, I got to watch the Cowboys. All right, all right. Dad, my, my, real, my real desire right now is to lay here on the uh, couch and eat Cracker Jacks. Anyone remember what Cracker Jacks were? Okay, I just want to make sure I'm preaching to the choir here. My father would have introduced me to my special calling. And my special calling would have been right here. And I probably wouldn't be able to sit down for a while. Jesus was motivated by obedience to the Father, but he was also motivated by love, love. Matthew 23, 37 says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how oft would I have gathered children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you are not willing. One of the greatest problems in the church we have today, and it's a, it's a tragedy. We have a dry-eyed church in a hell-bent world. We lack love. The heartache of sin no longer brings tears to our eyes. It doesn't break our heart. The pain of humanity, it doesn't penetrate our emotions just as long as it doesn't affect me. As long as it's not happening in my house, I turn a blind eye. I I move away. I don't feel like I have a responsibility. You know, (laughs) 
I heard a man say one time, what would happen if a wealthy benefactor were to come into our church this morning and come down front and issue you a challenge, each one of you, that he would give you a thousand dollars for everyone that you witness to this week. And just think about that. If you were to witness to a hundred people, that would be a hundred thousand dollars. How many do you think would be witnesses? Come on! Be honest. Yeah! Yes! What a shame that we won't do for love what we would do for money. Ouch. Listen, loved ones. His mandate is my mandate. His motive is my motive. His mission is my mission. He was motivated by obedience. He was motivated by love. But praise God, he was motivated by necessity. John chapter 3 says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him would have eternal life. God doesn't operate an emergency management program from heaven. Okay? There's no alternative methods to salvation and evangelism. God's plan for you and me, God's mission for you and me, God's motivation for you and me, God's mandate for you and me is to reach souls one person at a time. One witness at a time. People reaching people. There's no plan B. And Jesus was obedient to God the Father. God's way is the only way. He was motivated by obedience. He was motivated by love. He was motivated by necessity. And he was motivated by joy. Absolute joy. Hebrews 12.2 says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. I want you to know this morning, if the mandate of the Master is a chore in your life, there's something corrupt. There's something contentious. There's something that's been compromised. Because Jesus was motivated by joy. Joy. How many of us woke up this morning and said, Hallelujah, I get to go to church. Oh, I'm so happy. I can't wait. I might skip brushing my teeth. I can't wait to get there. Eh, how many ifs? Joy. Joy. And if his joy is missing, we better take a close look at our life. We better take a close look at our, our true salvation. If we can't wait to get here, if we can't wait to hug our brothers and sisters, you know what? I hugged Miss Susan Greer this morning, and I told her, I said, I am so blessed to be here, Pastor, because I love her. And she loves me. She always lets me know she loves me. And she's faithful in this church, as so many of you are. There's a joy that should be unspeakable and full of glory. Joy is defined as delight, jubilation, exultation. And Hebrews chapter 12 says, the joy of Jesus held him on the cross. The joy of Jesus strengthened him as he carried the cross down the Via Della Rosa. The joy of Jesus was present as the cat of nine tails 
ripped and tore his body asunder. Yet still, God's word says in Hebrews, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. What was that joy spurred by? It was spurred by you and me. Because you see, the whole time that that was happening, Jesus saw Sandy. He saw Kathleen. He saw Charlotte. He saw Kyvan and Ray. And he knew what he had prepared for all of us. And no matter what he had to go through, no matter what it cost him, he looked at the joy. The ultimate joy of knowing that one day, you and me would be with him. In peace. And comfort. And harmony. And love. Listen to me. We have a mandate. We have a mandate from the Master. And I'm going to ask you this morning, is His mandate your mandate? Is His mission your mission? Is His motivation your motivation? Remember our text this morning. As the Father has sent me, even so, I'm sending you. But listen, before we can be sent, we first have to come. Amen? If we haven't come, we can't be sent. John chapter 6, verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I'll never, ever, ever cast out. Mandates from the Master. Let's stand together. Father, as always, again, thank You for Your precious Word. Thank You for the ability to preach Your Word. Thank You for the loving ears that want to hear Your Word. Father, I ask You in Jesus' name, please move among all that are here. Please move among everyone that's listening, wherever they are, everyone that's watching, for us to follow the mandates from the Master, we must first come to Him. I pray, Father, that You would draw all men unto You, and that we would turn our eyes upon Jesus and look to You. I ask it in the precious name of the risen Christ, Jesus. Amen.